Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. The Nutcracker mm-hmm. <laughs> it has become such a huge tradition for so many people around Christmas. I know for my own part, my mom and I went to the North Carolina School of the Arts production of The Nutcracker together for many, many years. Uh, We had a family friend a little older than me who went from being Clara as a child to being asked to come back and uh, be the Sugar Plum Fairy after she had gone on to continue her dance education in New York. For a whole lot of people, The Nutcracker is the first ballet they ever experience, or maybe the only ballet they ever experience. And it's by far the biggest show and the biggest source of ticket revenue for a lot of ballet companies. And even if you have never experienced this whole ballet, music from The Nutcracker has also become a huge part, not just of the Christmas season, but also beyond it. Like, I can even remember a commercial (laughs) from the 1980s that set a Smurfberry Crunch jingle to the march from Act One. Uh, I will maybe sing that in our behind the scenes. Okay. I, <laughs> I, I will try to remember that you just said that. Uh, it's a little odd when you think about it that the Nutcracker Ballet has become such a phenomenon, particularly in North America, but it's also spread to other places too, considering that it is a Russian adaptation of a German story that was never really a Christmas staple in its home country. Um, So that is the story that we are going to tell on the show today. The ballet The Nutcracker is based on the 1816 story The Nutcracker and the Mouse King by Ernst Theodore Amadeus Hoffman, or E.T.A. Hoffman. Uh, His name at birth was actually Ernst Theodore Wilhelm, but he changed Wilhelm to Amadeus out of admiration for Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Hoffman was born in 1776 in Konigsberg, Prussia, now Kaliningrad, Russia, although he spent most of his adult life in what is now Germany. Hoffman wore a lot of hats. He trained as a lawyer and served as a law officer before turning his attention to music. He worked as a composer and a music critic. He was also an artist, a theater director, and a writer, and his written work included a lot of fairy tales, including works for children. His fiction tended to be pretty haunting and strange, with stories that carried a whole sense of ambiguity. They blurred the lines or toyed with the relationships between imagination and reality. And this included his work for young readers, even though a lot of children's literature at that point tended to focus more on more heavy-handed didactic stories and morality tales. That wasn't the only stuff being published, (laughs) But a lot of it was very, very moralizing. The Nutcracker and the Mouse King is sometimes described as the first fantasy written specifically for children. The story contains 14 short chapters, some of which just stop rather than reaching any sort of logical pause in the narrative. There is some speculation that it was broken up this way so that it could be read one chapter per night, starting on Christmas Eve, as the story does, and ending with Epiphany on January 6th. So parts of the story will be familiar to anyone who has seen the Nutcracker Ballet. The main character is a seven-year-old girl, although her name is Marie Stahlbaum, not Clara Silberhaus as it is in a lot of productions of the Nutcracker. She has a younger brother, Fritz, and an older sister, Louise, although Louise does not play a big part in the story. Their godfather, Drosselmeyer, is both beloved and a little frightening. He is old and mysterious and wears an eye patch and he arrives on Christmas Eve with gifts for the family. One of those gifts is an ingenious clockwork palace, but the children, especially Fritz, are quickly bored of it. The clockwork figures just do the same thing over and over. Then Marie finds a nutcracker among the other Christmas gifts. Basic tools made to crack nuts have existed at least since the 14th century, but carved wooden nutcracker dolls, typically made to look like soldiers, started to become popular in 17th century Germany. 
In the story, the Nutcracker is meant as a gift for everyone, but Marie is particularly taken with it and deeply upset when her brother breaks it by forcing it to crack a nut that is much too big. Marie tries to bind up the Nutcracker's injury with a ribbon, and Drosselmeyer does a more thorough repair later on. That night, Marie puts the Nutcracker to bed, and that's where the name Clara comes in. Clara is Marie's new doll, and Marie commandeers Clara's doll bed so that the Nutcracker will have a comfortable place to recuperate. As she is checking on the Nutcracker late at night, Marie sees the Mouse King and his army preparing for a war against her brother's toy soldiers, who have all come alive. The doll Clara saves the Nutcracker when he tries to make a foolhardy leap from the top of a high shelf to join in the fray. Marie also sees Drosselmeyer on top of the grandfather clock in place of the owl that is normally there, although he does not intervene in the fight with the mice. After hitting the Mouse King with her shoe, Marie swoons and later wakes up in her own bed. So a lot of what we have just said follows a lot of the action of Act One in most productions of The Nutcracker. So if you've seen The Nutcracker, it's probably pretty familiar. But in Hoffman's story, Marie cuts her arm on a piece of broken glass during this battle. And when Drosselmeyer comes to visit her during her recovery, he tells her a story, one involving a royal clockmaker also named Drosselmeyer. In this story within a story, clockmaker Drosselmeyer served a king and queen who had a beautiful baby daughter, Princess Perlipat. The queen was preparing fat to make sausages or puddings, which were the king's favorite dish, when Lady Mouse Rink, who's basically the queen of the mice, asked her for some of it. The queen obliged, but then Lady Mouse Rink and her kin ate so much of the fat that there was not enough left for the king's puddings. The king was furious, and Drosselmeyer, the clockmaker, decided to use his ingenuity to build traps to get rid of all the mice. Lady Mouse Rink, of course, did not appreciate that so many of her kin were killed in the royal family's new mouse traps, so she cursed Princess Perlipat with ugliness. After consulting with the royal astrologer, Drosselmeyer determined that Princess Perlipat could only be cured with a supernaturally hard Krakatuk nut, cracked open and presented to her by a young man who had never been shaved and never worn boots. After years and years of searching, Drosselmeyer finally found a Krakatuk nut in possession of his brother in Nuremberg. And his brother's son, so his nephew, turned out to have never been shaved and never worn boots. Uncle and nephew returned to the palace with the nut where a long line of potential suitors lined up to try to bite it open. All of them failed until the younger Drosselmeyer, that nephew, the last in line, succeeded. But the young Drosselmeyer and Princess Perlipat did not live happily ever after. Just after breaking the curse on the princess, the clockmaker's nephew accidentally stepped on Lady Mouse Rink, killing her. With her dying breath, Lady Mouse Rink cursed him, transforming him into a nutcracker. Princess Perlipat, horrified, banished the Nutcracker and his uncle, the Clockmaker. The royal astronomer, who was also exiled for his role in all of this, predicted that the Nutcracker's curse would be lifted only if someone fell in love with him. Of course, at this point, Marie, hearing this story, concludes that it is real, that her beloved Nutcracker toy is really the transmogrified nephew of the royal Clockmaker, and that royal clockmaker is none other than her godfather, Drosselmeyer. Marie demands to know why Drosselmeyer is not helping his nephew. After all, she saw him right there on the clock on the night that the Nutcracker fought the Mouse King. Once Marie has deduced what's going on, the Mouse King starts demanding tribute, eating his way through all her treats and toys. Then one day she notices that the Nutcracker has a spot of blood on his neck. As she's cleaning it off, he asks for a sword. She gives it to him, and he is finally victorious in his fight against the Mouse King, cutting off the Mouse King's seven heads and presenting Marie with seven little crowns. The Nutcracker takes Marie to a magical kingdom with meadows made of candy, a lemonade river, and towns made of gingerbread and bonbons. She soon learns that the Nutcracker is the prince of Comfiturimburg, or the Kingdom of Sweets. 
Marie once again wakes up in her own bed, and when she tries to tell her family what has happened, they are dismissive. But soon, her godfather Drosselmeyer's young nephew arrives from Nuremberg. The nephew thanks Marie for saving him, and he proposes. A year and a day later, Marie and the younger Drosselmeyer marry, and from there reign as king and queen of the Kingdom of Sweets. This whole story is twisting and layered. It folds back on itself at various points. Marie often tells her parents what she's experienced and seen, only for them to blame her fevered mind and order her to stop telling such wild tales. As her godfather Drosselmeyer tells her this story, he also suggests that it's real, but then when he talks to her parents, he dismisses what she's saying as fancy. As one example, he tells her parents that the Mouse King's seven crowns are a gift that he gave her years before, certainly not something belonging to a seven-headed Mouse King. (laughs) Gaslighting. The book's tone is fairly ominous, actually, and it draws heavily from German romanticism. The brothers Grimm and their dark and sometimes gruesome collections of fairy tales date from around this same time. Past podcast subject Caspar David Friedrich was another of Hoffman's contemporaries, and many of his landscapes have a similarly eerie and foreboding, although still very beautiful, feel. But in 1844, more than 20 years after E.T.A. Hoffman's death, past podcast subject Alexandre Dumas-Père adapted The Nutcracker and the Mouse King and translated it into French, The resulting book had the same basic plot and the same sort of story within a story, but with a tone that was generally a lot lighter and more cheerful than the original, and it is this version that was adapted into a ballet. Or at least part of it was. We're going to talk more about that after a sponsor break. Piotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky was born in Russia in 1840, and he started composing music by the age of four and taking piano lessons at five. But Russia didn't have a formal system of education for musicians and composers yet, so this, it did not occur to his parents at first that this could be a career for him. So they focused his education on the idea that he would become a civil servant. That eventually changed, though. He became one of the first students at the St. Petersburg Conservatory after it was established in 1862. And he eventually became famous, both within and outside of Russia, composing seven symphonies, 11 operas, and various concertos, cantatas, quartets, choral works, and three ballets, Swan Lake, The Sleeping Beauty, and The Nutcracker. And the Nutcracker Ballet was part of a two-part commission from Russia's Imperial Theaters in St. Petersburg, the other part being a one-act opera. The ballet was his second collaboration to include both Imperial Theaters director Ivan Vsevolovsky and French choreographer Marius Petipa, chief choreographer of the Imperial Ballet. The three men had previously worked together on The Sleeping Beauty, with Zevlowski commissioning the work, writing the libretto, and being heavily involved in the costume and set design, and Petipa choreographing the ballet and providing detailed instructions to Tchaikovsky on the music. The Sleeping Beauty had been a success after opening at the Mariinsky Theater in St. Petersburg in 1890, and Vesvlowski was hoping for something similar to happen with The Nutcracker, The Nutcracker and the Mouse King had become a well-known and widely read children's story, and he chose Alexandre Dumas' adaptation of it as the ballet's starting point. Even though classical ballet does not typically include spoken language or narration, by the 19th century, the process of creating a ballet generally started still with a libretto, a written narrative laying out the story that the ballet would tell. The composer, choreographer, set designer, and costume designer, basically everyone who worked on creating the ballet, would rely on this libretto to translate the story for the stage. The Nutcracker's libretto is generally credited to both Przewalowski and Petipa, although it is not entirely clear who did what in preparing it. But the Nutcracker collaboration among these men did not seem to have gone as well as it did with The Sleeping Beauty. With both ballets, Petipa provided Tchaikovsky with detailed instructions about the type of music that was needed, as in the full ballet was broken down into its scenes and dances and variations, 
with Petipa giving very precise instructions about how many measures of what kind of music was needed for each of them. It reads almost like a shopping list. But in the Sleeping Beauty, these notes and the libretto, they had added up to a story that had deeper themes, which Tchaikovsky could explore through musical devices like leitmotifs. These represented aspects of the story while also unifying the ballet. In addition to the story of Princess Aurora, the Sleeping Beauty also dealt with themes of good versus evil, and Tchaikovsky could just explore all of this and represent it through music. Meanwhile, the libretto for The Nutcracker had abandoned the deeper themes and ambiguities of Hoffman's story. The entire middle portion of The Nutcracker and the Mouse King had been cut almost entirely, leaving only The Christmas Party, Drosselmeyer Bringing Gifts, The Battle Between The Nutcracker and the Mouse King, and The Voyage to the Kingdom of Sweets. After a grand final waltz, The Nutcracker was to end with an apotheosis with a beehive surrounded by bees. The main character, now named Clara, did not return home after her travels through the Kingdom of Sweets, so it really wasn't even clear what the point of it all was. On top of his creative dissatisfaction, Tchaikovsky experienced depression and anxiety throughout his life, along with social pressures and taboos stemming from his attraction to other men at a time when homosexuality was both illegal and deeply stigmatized. And all of this may have fed into his struggle to get started on the Nutcracker. In April of 1891, he wrote to Zevlowski about it, saying, quote, Here in Rouen, I had to call on extraordinary willpower to make an agonizing effort in order to work. As a result, what comes out is colorless, dry, hasty, and wretched, The awareness that things are not going well torments me and agonizes me to the point of sickness. A consuming depression constantly gnaws at my heart, and I have not for a long time felt as unhappy as now. The day after Tchaikovsky wrote this letter, he learned, by reading it in a newspaper, that his sister Alexandra had died. He was, at that moment, on the way to board a ship for a tour of the United States, where he would, among other things, conduct music he had composed at the grand opening of Carnegie Hall. This would have been terrible in any circumstance, but this was particularly terrible timing. But Tchaikovsky did not cancel his tour or his appearances in the United States. Instead, it seems as though he took this transatlantic voyage as a time to contemplate and to refocus Music historians and theorists have noted that the Nutcracker incorporates more borrowed folk melodies and existing musical themes than most of his other work does, kind of suggesting that once he did finally get underway, he still had trouble feeling creative. There's also some suggestion that the character of the Sugar Plum Fairy is meant to embody his late sister, who was known to the family as Sasha. Tchaikovsky may not have been the only person who was facing very real creative trouble with the Nutcracker. Although Marius Petipa had been the one to write Tchaikovsky's instructions for the music and initial notations for the choreography, he did not choreograph most of the ballet. He became ill shortly after that work began, and he left most of it to his assistant, Lev Ivanov. According to Petipa's memoirs, Ivanov did all the staging and choreographed all the dances. Petipa was 73 when this happened, but there is some speculation that he really wasn't all that sick, and he just kind of didn't want to work on this nonsensical show. Ivanov worked from Petipa's notes, but he didn't always follow them. For example, in Act 2, Petipa called for, quote, Trepak for the end of the dance turning on the floor. Trepak is a folk dance from Ukraine and Russia, but Ivanov took this piece in a totally different direction using hoops, and lead dancer Alexander Shuryev choreographed his part himself. Uh, This is why in some productions of The Nutcracker Day, Trepak is this intensely athletic dance full of leaping and squatting and dancers that are dressed as like peasants or maybe Cossacks will. In others, they are uh, in candy stripes and dancing with hoops. If you've only seen the first version, the first time you've seen the second one, (laughs) (laughs) you might feel like it was a (laughs) ripoff. Um, yeah. 
Tchaikovsky compiled a Nutcracker suite featuring selections from the ballet, which was first performed in March of 1892. And the full ballet premiered at the Mariinsky Theater in St. Petersburg, Russia, on December 18th of that year, or December 6th under the old-style calendar. It followed Tchaikovsky's one-act opera, Yolanta, which had also been the other part of this commission. One of the criticisms of Tchaikovsky's work during his lifetime was that it was not Russian enough. But the Nutcracker includes several elements that are really hallmarks of this period of Russian theater and ballet. This is really considered to be Russian ballet's golden age. Tsar Alexander III was a patron of the arts and the theater, and a lot of the work that was created during his reign involved dramatic sets and costumes and the sorts of spectacles that the Tsar generally enjoyed. Much of the second act of The Nutcracker is also essentially a court celebration, with Clara, as a guest to the Kingdom of Sweets, being presented with a pageant of all of the kingdom's best and brightest. And some of this court review highlights Russia in its presentation, especially the series of Spanish, Chinese, Arabian, and Russian dances, also known as Chocolate Tea Coffee Tripak. Especially in Petipa's original notations, Trepak was to be the showstopper, suggesting that Russia was the best among nations. These dances combine with others in Act 2 to suggest the idea of many nations living together harmoniously under the rule of one benevolent monarch, that is the Sugar Plum Fairy, along with her prince. A 2016 article in the journal Dance Research by Damien Maillet also explores the idea that the use of French songs and costumes inspired by fashion of the French Revolutionary Era allude to the alliance between France and Russia that developed in the 1890s. And Tsar Alexander III does seem to have liked this ballet. Tchaikovsky wrote a letter to his brother saying that the Tsar, quote, was delighted and sent for me to his box and said a whole lot of kind words. I love that. A whole lot of kind words. It's just a great turn of phrase. But as for everybody else, uh, reviews a little bit mixed, and the bad reviews were often explicitly and pointedly bad. People pointed out the same aspects of the libretto that had caused Tchaikovsky so much frustration, including the fact that Act 1 and Act 2 almost felt like two totally different ballets, neither of which made a whole lot of sense. Some critics insisted that Act 1 was barely a ballet at all. People mostly stood around and pantomimed. In the words of one critic, quote, First of all, the Nutcracker can under no condition be called a ballet. It does not satisfy even one of the demands of a ballet. Ballet as a basic genre of art is mimed drama and consequently must contain all the elements of norm drama. On the other hand, there must be a place in ballet for plastic attitudes and dances made up of the entire essence of classical choreography. There is nothing of this in The Nutcracker. There is not even a subject. And also, the stage was full of children. At this point in Russian ballet history, younger ballet students did not usually share the stage with older teens and adults. Reviewers bemoaned the fact that this ballet seemed to have been made by children for children. To add to that, many of the boys in it were not dance students at all. They had been recruited from a military academy. The focus on children in the ballet's first act also meant that the most striking balletic performances done by the company's most prominent dancers didn't happen until very late in the evening in Act 2. And because the Nutcracker followed this other one-act opera, that meant that they got on stage very, very late People felt like they had watched a whole opera and then a bunch of kids running around for an hour before the real ballet even started, and then that ballet was over with no real resolution. Overall, though, Tchaikovsky's score was praised, although sometimes that praise was a little bit backhanded, as in, quote, in sum, it's a pity that so much good music is expended on such nonsense, so unworthy of attention. But the music, in general, is excellent. Tchaikovsky clearly had huge trouble getting started and found the early work on the ballet incredibly difficult, but it does seem that he was pleased enough with the score once he was actually done with it. One thing to note here is that we don't actually have the choreography from the Nutcracker's debut performances. Petipa's instructions to Tchaikovsky have survived, along with his notes and the libretto, but the oldest surviving set of more complete comprehensive notes 
was not written down until a few years later. So it's not really clear whether any of the criticisms of the dancing itself led the choreography to evolve over the Mariinsky Theater's 1892-93 to ballet season. Once that season was over, though, it does not appear that major changes were made to the Nutcracker until after the Russian Revolution. While the ballet's reception was mixed to poor, its music became far more popular, particularly the Nutcracker Suite. Orchestras in Europe and North America started performing the Nutcracker Suite in the early to mid-1890s, and it became widely recognizable on both sides of the Atlantic. It wasn't until decades later that the Nutcracker became a winter holiday tradition, though. We will talk more about that after a sponsor break. After the 1892 to 1893 ballet season, the Nutcracker only made spotty appearances on Russian stages for a while. Sometimes companies performed only the second act or a selection of highlights. The ballet was revived in 1909, and in 1919, Alexander Gorsky staged a version that combined the character of Clara with the Sugar Plum Fairy for the first time. Vasily Vinonin introduced new choreography in 1934, also casting adult dancers in what had originally been children's roles. But overall, the Nutcracker's appearances on Russian and then Soviet stages was pretty spotty. Although the narrative takes place at Christmas, it also was not a Christmas standard. Easter is really the more important and festive holiday in the Eastern Orthodox Church. The Soviet Union also banned Christmas celebrations in the late 1920s, leading to the rise of New Year's as a secular holiday. The Nutcracker was performed outside of Russia and the Soviet Union for the first time in 1934. That was in London, based on choreographic notes by Nicholas Sergeyev, who had been the company manager of the Imperial Ballet in St. Petersburg. When he left Russia in 1918, he had taken the choreography for more than 20 ballets with him. They had been recorded using a dance notation method that had been developed by Vladimir Ivanovich Stepanov. In 1940, the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo presented selections from the Nutcracker while on tour in the U.S. Then, Disney's Fantasia debuted in theaters on November 13th of 1940. This film was not a financial success, in part because World War II shut down movie theaters in Europe. But it is credited with popularizing classical music in the United States, including selections from the Nutcracker Suite. Some of the Nutcracker pieces in Fantasia include the dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy, during which fairies flitter about opening flowers and sending dewdrops down spider webs. Mushrooms twirl around during the Chinese dance. There are long-tailed fish that gracefully swim around in coffee and thistles that very energetically dance during Trepak. Although neither the fish nor the mushrooms are human, they both retain some of the exoticized stereotype depictions that are often part of the Nutcracker Ballet during the Chinese and Arabian dances. The mushrooms, for example, have slanted eyes and a posture that suggests they're wearing robes, and the fish's movement and sensual demeanor suggests a harem. Fantasia has a content warning when viewed on Disney Plus today, noting that it, quote, includes negative depictions and or mistreatment of people or cultures, although that's usually interpreted as referencing centaurs who appear in the Pastoral Symphony, some of which have been cut out of the current version of the film. When introducing the Nutcracker Suite portion of Fantasia, narrator Deems Taylor explains that the Nutcracker Suite is part of a ballet that wasn't much of a success and, quote, nobody performs it nowadays. That was more or less true in 1940, but today that sentence is hilarious. Four years after Fantasia, the San Francisco Ballet staged the first U.S. performance of the full Nutcracker Ballet, The ballet's founder and choreographer William Christensen talked through ideas for it with choreographer George Balanchine and Alexandra Danilova of Ballet Russe. Christensen had never actually seen the full Nutcracker Ballet and later said that these conversations, and particularly Balanchine's insights, had a huge influence on the San Francisco production. 
1954, the Nutcracker opened at the New York City Ballet with choreography by co-founder George Balanchine, whose name has been anglicized from George Balanchivadze. He was born in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1904, and he had studied at the Imperial School of Ballet and the Mariinsky Theater. He appeared in productions of the Nutcracker before the Russian Revolution, which means that he learned and observed choreography that had started with Petipa and Ivanov back in the 19th century. He also learned other versions by other choreographers before leaving Russia in 1924. Lincoln Kirstein invited Balanchine to the U.S. in 1933 to establish the School of American Ballet and the American Ballet Company. Kirstein and Balanchine went on to establish the New York City Ballet in 1948. In the New York City Ballet's 1954 Nutcracker, past podcast subject Maria Tallchief danced to the part of the Sugar Plum Fairy. Tallchief was a citizen of Osage Nation and is regarded as the first prima ballerina in the United States. In this version, the young protagonist's name is Marie rather than Clara, and Marie, the Nutcracker Prince, and other roles in this first one were danced by almost 40 children from the School of American Ballet. This production was also one in which Trepak features dancers dressed in candy stripes dancing with hoops. Although Balanchine's Nutcracker first opened on February 2nd of 1954, it quickly became the heart of a special holiday ballet season and the New York City Ballet has performed it every year since then. A lot of what made the Nutcracker so reviled in Russia in 1892 had nearly the opposite effect in the United States in 1954. It was still not a show that made a lot of sense from a plot standpoint, but it captured a sense of childlike holiday wonder. The audience response was less, oh, what are these children doing here? This is ballet, and more, oh, look at those kids, they're adorable. This is wholesome family entertainment. Even without a logical plot to follow, the Nutcracker seemed to celebrate values like home and family and holiday cheer, and that was not an accident. Balanchine and the rest of the creative team at the New York City Ballet had understood that their company desperately needed something that could have mass appeal, and the Nutcracker wound up suiting that need extremely well. And even though this was happening during the Cold War, when the United States was deeply and increasingly distrustful of the Soviet Union, which makes it seem real weird that people would get so excited about a Russian ballet, ballet was actually something of an exception. One of the many, many ways that the U.S. and the USSR maintained a rivalry and competed with each other during the Cold War was through dance and ballet specifically. An abridged version of the New York City Ballet's Nutcracker aired on CBS in 1957. And then a somewhat more complete version aired the following year in 1958 with Balanchine in the role of Drosselmeyer. In the 1958 version, June Lockhart, who had recently replaced Cloris Leachman as Timmy's adoptive mother on the TV show Lassie, provides an opening introduction in which she says, quote, Christmas Day isn't Christmas without a real old-fashioned story of magic and miracles. Two televised ballets two years in a row established the Nutcracker as an invented tradition. It reminds me a little bit of the uh, Yes, Virginia story that (laughs) had a similar trajectory. So, Balanchine's Nutcracker was huge for the New York City Ballet and for ballet as a whole. As its popularity spread, it became the production that ballet companies used to help fund the rest of their season, sometimes getting about half of the year's ticket revenue just from the Nutcracker. That, of course is a blessing and a curse. One widely repeated quote that's often attributed to dance critic Richard Buckle is that each Christmas, quote, we are all one nutcracker closer to death. For much of its history before this point, ballet had typically been performed on grand stages and before royal courts. And while the Nutcracker is certainly still performed among elite dance companies on prestigious stages, It's also found a home in places like elementary schools and youth centers. It has spurred on the popularity of ballet as an art form. The popularity of the Nutcracker also goes beyond ballet. It's one of the reasons why decorative Nutcrackers ultimately spread beyond Germany, especially as holiday decorations. In 1961, First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy chose Nutcracker ballet-themed decorations for a Christmas tree in the Blue Room at the White House 
and that established the tradition to have a themed Christmas tree at the presidential residence. Sadly, the people who were most involved in the original creation of the Nutcracker did not live to see this success and influence. Lev Ivanov died in 1901 at the age of 67, Ivan Vizevlovsky died in 1909 at the age of 74, and Marius Petipa died in 1910. He was 92 at that point. All three of them outlived Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, who died on November 6, 1893, or October 25th in the old-style calendar. His cause of death at the time was reported as cholera, but there is also speculation that he took his own life and that this may have been connected to a matter of honor related to his sexual orientation. He was only 53 at the time, and the Nutcracker was his last ballet. One of the things that we've touched on a little bit is that parts of the Nutcracker often involve racist stereotypes, especially the national dances of Spanish or chocolate, Arabian or coffee, Chinese or tea, and Russian or trepak. Trepak, of course, was meant to be a reflection of Russian ideals, including bravery and physical and military prowess, especially in its original conception as a folk dance. Although the music for the Arabian dance is adapted from a Georgian lullaby, it and the Spanish, Arabian, and Chinese dances have historically all used musical elements and costumes and choreography to suggest some racial and ethnic stereotypes. How or whether ballet companies staging the Nutcracker have dealt with this in more recent years is really all over the place, from making zero changes to re-envisioning those pieces in a completely different direction to hiring dancers from places like China and the Middle East to re-choreograph those pieces in a more authentic way. The Nutcracker has also proved itself to be almost infinitely adaptable. At this point, there are multiple film and TV versions, along with prequels, sequels, and reimaginings. Although many stage productions are based on Balanchine's choreography or on other choreography that has its roots in the work of Petipa and Ivanov, there are so many others, so we're going to list just a few examples. In the 1980s, the Pacific Northwest Ballet and choreographer Kent Stoll wanted to return to the spirit of E.T.A. Hoffman's original story. To that end, they brought in Maurice Sendak to design the sets and write the libretto for a new staging of The Nutcracker. This became the Pacific Northwest Ballet's version of The Nutcracker for about three decades, and it was released as a film in 1986. They also published a translation of E.T.A. Hoffman's story as a book, It was translated by Ralph Mannheim and accompanied by Sendak's illustrations. A version called Hard Nut debuted in Brussels in 1991, and it uses Tchaikovsky's score and is based on the E.T.A. Hoffman story, but it is a satiric comedy with choreography by Mark Morris and a production designed based on the work of illustrator and cartoonist Charles Burns. Harlem Nutcracker debuted in 1996, choreographed by Donald Byrd, and working off of Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn's arrangement of the Nutcracker Suite. And in this ballet, Clara is a widowed grandmother facing her first Christmas without her late husband. Debbie Allen Dance Academy's Hot Chocolate Nutcracker incorporates all kinds of different music and dance styles, with the rats narrating the story. Parts of this are shown in the 2020 documentary Dance Dreams, Hot Chocolate Nutcracker. And then there are also just smaller special touches that ballet companies around the world have used to ground their productions of the Nutcracker in a particular time and place. And that includes in its home of Russia. Moscow Ballet's Great Russian Nutcracker includes a giant Matryoshka doll and Russian folk figures like Dead Moroz and Snegruchka. This ballet's heroine is known as Masha, which is a Russian derivative of the name Marie. Oh, Nutcracker. We'll talk about some more Nutcracker stuff in the behind the scenes. because So much. I have notes. I have experience notes. as an audience member, and you have experience as a dancer. Yep. Uh, do you have listener mail in the meantime? I do. This is from Larissa. Larissa said... I've wanted to write in to at least share a picture of my dog with you two. Then I saw these episodes while picking something to listen to on my drive home from work. I knew I had to write in. I will pause and say the episodes in question are the Ida Tarbell episodes. I'm going to return to the email. I grew up in Titusville, Pennsylvania. This is one thing I did not miss in history class. In Titusville itself, the Tarbell House still stands. And last I knew, you can book tea parties there. 
The museum is interactive, which depicts the timeline of the oil boom and has engines and oil rigs in the park. Drake's well is also replicated to exactly the original second one. The very first one ignited from a lantern, so no photograph for recreation. The hills of the area were just derricks, no trees. I know there are photos of this by John Mather. Also, it was interesting to hear the Tarbells lived in Rouseville. I had never seen a historical marker like we have all over the area, but right in that small area is the oldest still producing oil well. I was so happy to see this come up as a topic. No one knows about our little area, and I'm sure a future idea could be Titusville itself and or Pit Hole, the ghost town. Uh, and then we got a picture of Larissa's dog, Landon, who is three years old and is a pit bull terrier mix and is adorable. BB. So thank you so much for this email and the picture. Larissa, if you would like to send us an email, we're at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. And we're also all over social media at Missed in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you like to get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 